Evening. We want to call to order the land planning meeting this evening. Um, first, I'll take roll call of the members. Uh, Margaret Bromfeld. I'll call a roll for you. Yeah. <laughs> Board member De La Viga. Board member Bromfield. Board member Strom. Here. Board member Massing. Here. Board member Mathers. Board member Vitali. Here. Chair Lorreen. Here. Everybody will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, we need to approve minutes from two meetings. The first, the February 11th meeting. Did anybody have any comments? Okay, would someone like to make a motion? Move approval. Second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The next one is the March 11th meeting, which really wasn't a meeting, but if somebody would like to Move make approval. a motion. <laughs> second? Yeah, I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, and would somebody like to make a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? Approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. All right, do we have any comments for the public on non-agenda items for this evening? Okay. Do we have any comments from the board members on non-agenda items? Okay, wonderful. Okay, first up, the Palmetto Cove rezoning. <clears throat> Good afternoon, LPA board, Madam Chair. My name is Tom Reitz, Senior Planner. I'll be presenting tonight's presentation. Tom, so, it's a little hard to hear you. Sorry, I, know, I was thinking that too. So yeah, I'm going to speak louder. up a little <laughs> bit, and if I could just bring this down. Um, the application is a rezoning from R3 to RPUD. The project's called Palmetto Cove. The site's located just south of Howe Patioke uh, Avenue and west of Palm City Road, across and back of the Publix. The site is approximately 0.97 acres. It's made up of two parcels separated by a city right-of-way. So the existing land use is office residential, and that will support today's um, proposal for multifamily units. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, rezoning is from R3 to RPUD, Residential Planned Unit Development. So the site exists of six units on the north parcel and the remaining seven units on the south parcel. The ex main entrance into the multifamily uh, complex is off from Palm City Road. It will use existing city right-of-way that's currently unimproved. There's a secondary exit from Hal Patioke Street to the north. They're also proposing to um, proposing six parking spaces on Howe Patioke that will go towards their required parking. There's an existing or proposed pool and clubhouse, proposed drainage at the south of the site, and an eight-foot sidewalk along Palm City Road. So you can see the view in these renderings from Palm City Road facing west. They're quite attractive buildings. They meet the city's minimum design standards. It actually exceed the, the city's design standards. Um, and then the bottom is uh, southwest facing. And you can see the, the two parcels divided by the city right, uh, improved city right of way. The applicant's asking for two variances to the code, one being density and the other the uh, buffer um, land use transition. 
And for the density, the land use uh, policy 8.72 um, allows up to 11.62 dwelling units uh, per acre in the office residential land use category and up to 30 dwelling units by city commission approval. And the applicant is proposing only 13.1 dwelling units per acre. The second uh, request for departure from the code um, has to do with the buffer and the required buffer in this case would be 8.75 feet with a 35 foot transitional buffer without any structure. The applicant is actually meeting part of the buffer requirement in that it's the buildings held back 55 feet, but they're only pro providing a five foot landscape area on the north section. And then on the south section, they're only providing an eight foot landscape buffer. Now the applicant has provided uh, a six foot wall on the north parcel only and the south parcel is separated by an existing chain link fence. So as I mentioned, the applicant is proposing a wall on the north parcel. Staff's recommendation is that they include a wall in the south parcel that wraps not only on the west border, but wraps around to the south. And this separates from single family residential. So, Two conditions that I want to introduce is that the applicant shall provide a final site plan showing two bike racks, an electrical vehicle parking space location, and the location of a centralized mailbox with dedicated parking space. And then the second one has to, having to do with the wall that they provide a final sh uh, site plan showing the six foot wall located on the entire western property line wrapping around on the south property line. With that, staff recommends approval of ordinance 2463-2021 with conditions. And that concludes my presentation. Is there anyone else that would like to make a presentation from the developer? Good evening, Terry McCarthy representing the developer. Uh, Tom, if you could go back to your location map. As they say in the real estate business, it's all about location, location, location. And I say that because you'll note where the subject property is, is directly behind the rear of Publix, which I've been by there several times, is not the most attractive site in town. To the north, up, if you will, there's a rather intense, older, multifamily de development. Tom, if you could go back to the first picture. Which way, Terry? For the first, very first one. In my opinion, this is a nice project, as is seen right here. Um, these are gonna be for sale. So the people that buy here are gonna be invested in this. Uh, as, I, as I've been going through that area several times. It's in with, within walking distance of downtown. Um, and it's a good project. And it, the, the, the developer is gonna spend a lot of dough to get from here to there. And to tell you what the developer feels about this, let me bring up Mike Faulkner, who can give you his insight. Mike's been here a long time, so it's, I think it'd be important for you to hear him. Good evening. I'm Michael Faulkner with Southern Landmark Homes. I've been a local resident of Martin County for the past 25 years. I've built many homes throughout the city of Stewart and Martin County. Uh, we look forward to this project. We put a lot of time and thought into this project. We spent about a year and a half developing this site plan. We've also moved some of the townhouses around to accommodate two large oak trees that we have on the project. Uh, we did put the eight foot wide sidewalks in. We agreed to the concrete wall between the small pool that we're putting in and the adjacent residential property to the um, west of that. So, and if you look at it, we worked closely with Dan Braden, a Braden and Braden Architects in the, 
lo local guy in the city of Stewart. He does most of my plans. And we really wanted something that would fit into the community. You know, if you, if you look at our plans, you know, we're going to have the lap siding up top, smooth stucco below, all concrete block, metal roofs. It looks like old Stewart. You know, it, it, it does belong here. You know, so. And, you know, pretty much everything that I build in Stewart, you know, if, if you drive by, if you see one of my properties, they're, they're noticeable. You know, they're all, they're all unique. You know, we're, we're trying to put out a product that people can look at it. They know that we built it. We care. I'm on the job site every day. You know, you know we have an excellent reputation. So, you know, look forward to your approval on this. And really, the heart of it is the increase in density, but you'll know from the staff report that what's allowed is 11.63, and we're asking for 13.1. I would suggest to you that in this location, that is warranted. We agree with the staff report. I must note that the one condition concerning the wall, we hadn't seen it before tonight, the bike rack and everything we're in agreement with. We just have to analyze that between this and the next commission. I'm not saying no, we just haven't talked about it. Um, I have Dan Braden, our architect, here tonight. Happy to uh, address any issues you may have. Susan O'Rourke is our traffic engineer. Susan is here to address any questions you may have, as is Mike. So, again, we, we agree with the staff report. Uh, Tom, I don't know that you, you uh, uh, told the, uh, the LPA board members, but we have given the appropriate notice. Actually, we gave it twice for the first hearing that uh, some of you were here that was continued, and we gave it again a second time so that no one felt, you know, deprived that they didn't know when the hearing would be. Happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> okay, is there anyone else from the um, developer and presentation perspective who would like to speak this evening? Okay, now we will allow for public comment. These comments need to be three minutes. Um, please don't cheer or do anything, just make the comment and then we'll move on to the next one. And do I have, I don't have the list. I haven't received any public comment cards. Oh, we need the public comment <laughs> cards. Thank you, and I will go in order that they are here. Um, thank you very much. Okay, first up is Mrs. Michelle Casse. Hi, good evening. Um, first, I just want to say that I have been uh, blessed to live in this neighborhood for 25 years. Um, my husband and I own the property immediately south um, of the property that is being developed. Um, I want to concur and say that the, the, uh, the plan does look uh, very attractive, um, and that is, is, is um, you know, we feel really proud to be an old Stewart community, and it's really charming. Um, so I, I, I think the plan's beautiful. It's not really, that part isn't our concern. You know, when I was growing up, my mom always used to say, if is a big word. And, and the zone chaining, changing is what concerns me most. Um, there's a lot of ifs that could happen if, um, if the zone gets changed and for some reason something falls through and this developer doesn't develop the property, then it opens up to 30, I believe, 30 homes or 30, um, so I'm, and I don't, this isn't my area of expertise, so, um, but from what I read, it looks like it does open it up to a potential 30 homes on that small property beside us. Um, so the ifs are really part of what I'm concerned about. Um, I would love there to be harmony uh, between the properties. I would love to invite um, anybody to come and talk with us if that uh, is something you'd be willing to do when you're developing. Um, and then the other concern that I have, we have um, our, our property is zoned R3 as well, so we're professional residential. We have our business there facing Palm City Road and our home faces um, faces the other street on uh, Riverview. 
And um, we often do see traffic at um, all sorts of times of the day, even 10.30 in the morning, that backs up from US-1 past our property to, say, Poppleton Creek Bridge. And so that, that concerns us a little bit, that, uh, that traffic sometimes inhibits people from coming into our, our parking lot for our business. Um, and I know I, I've spoken to, to some people that know um, in the city, and they say that really our, our little road, Palm City Road, can handle a lot more traffic than it does, but the reality of the people that are there is I can tell you it definitely has backup issues that we see on a pretty regular basis. And um, so that, in addition to I being on the south end, would really like the buffer to be, um, to be honored and be the most that it could be so that we can all live in the most amount of harmony would be appreciated. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Terry Silcox. Hi, I'm Terry Silcox. I'm a resident of the neighborhood. We live in the old Dyer House, which is on St. Lucie Crescent, so we are certainly familiar with the character of the neighborhood. Um, my concern is not that the builder is not doing a, a great thing for the community. I think the plan looks really nice and it is fitting with the community. But as Michelle said, I, I am also concerned about the changing of the zoning. Um, it is currently platted for 11 units and they want to put two more in. As far as I'm concerned, it would seem to me that if it's platted for 11, why change it? Just because you can change it doesn't mean you should change it. And that does open the door for many other things to happen. Um, I think that the request for the change is with a RPUD that gives them a lot more flexibility to put things in there that maybe we should be looking a little closer at. For example, um, I'm a little concerned about the permeability of the project. I don't see where the water runoff is all going. I know that there is a little area designated to the south. It is almost the same size as the area designated for seven houses in the back, which is a much larger area with a greater permeable surface. So my concern is um, if they end up, if that water runs off into that neighborhood behind them, then what happens to that neighborhood's runoff? And it, it's just a cascade, no, no pun intended. Um, it's a cascade of water throughout that older neighborhood. And the trouble with it, and we see it with every new house going in in that neighborhood, is the requirements are different for the height of the structure above the road surface. So all the old houses like mine are very low and all the new houses coming in are very high. And where is that water going? And I know everybody says the builder is responsible for it, but I can assure you once that builder leaves, they don't like to get that phone call saying, I have water and I have standing water in my yard and what are you going to do about it? Those seven houses that went in behind them they had the same issue, and I know that they struggled with that builder as well. So I think that it is a nice addition to the neighborhood. It's certainly very pretty. I just don't see why we need to change the zoning. They would give them a greater permeable surface, leave it as R3, and then we know what's going in there. It can never be anything different. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, James Flynn. Hi, my name is James Flynn, and I live in the neighborhood directly behind uh, to the west of this uh, proposed uh, plan, um, which is in the Bell Flora Estates uh, POA. Seven houses on that little street behind. Uh, we have the retention uh, pond that uh, Terry just uh, talked about. Um, I, I also have a concern, or, or the same concern is Terry and Michelle regarding the zoning. And the, my question, I guess, would be, is this rezoning uh, specific to this plan? Or is this, would these properties then be RPUD um, period going forward, regardless of whether this property, this plan goes through, um, whether the current owner decides to sell the property in six months, <clears throat> um, arguably with a more flexible zoning perhaps a more valuable property. Um, so is this specific, is the rezoning specific to the project or does it carry through in, uh, you know, relative perpetuity, I guess. Uh, and then also I would be interested to hear <clears throat> any details about, and you know, perhaps not tonight, but at another, whenever the appropriate time, um, 
as to stormwater runoff plans, uh, you know, uh, which way flow is intended to go and so forth. Thanks. Thank you very much. Robin Cartwright. Good evening or afternoon. Um, Robin Cartwright, 703 Southeast Hibiscus in Stewart. Um, I do not live adjacent to this property and this might have been more appropriate for public comments, but looking at the um, developments that are happening in the community, um, I've heard a couple of comments that the LPA and the county commissioners and the city commissioners don't care that here giving the opinion that residents don't care until it's truly in their backyard and 300 feet is really very few people's backyard. So what we've been hearing in the last couple of LPA meetings and in the city commission meetings is a lot of attaboys and thanks for doing this and making these concessions, which is great. I have no problem to a development. However, what I have a problem with is that we keep saying that we need affordable and attainable housing and obviously we need housing because that's what keeps being presented. However, over the vehement objections to people in the community and who live in the county, we're not seeing anything that's not getting approved. This LPA in the city state that they're concerned about density and housing costs, and yet these properties are going to be projected listed for sale according to the school report for $400,000 a unit, which is well in excess of anything that's being sold in that area right now. It's been confirmed that no traffic studies look at comparison in other projects. I get it, projects are started, they're stopped, they're tentative. Project A and B are still approved. If project A gets started later, the traffic is still going to happen as a result of the approval of the project. So previously, um, Linda Kay had provided a density map, which I'm happy to give to you again tonight. But let's talk about the 30 people in Palmetto Cove as they exit their development. Their kids are slated to go to school in Palm City, according to the report, because J.D. Parker and the other Stewart Elementary Schools are too full and they're over capacity. So those who drive and they try to turn left into Jensen, they're gonna end up driving through those exact neighborhoods that were mentioned through Poppleton Creek or down Manor Drive. And then they have to go over to Canner. And the reason that this matters is because when they turn right onto Canner, they're headed into Central Parkway Lofts, which will be presented to the city um, on Monday for a second reading for a proposal. You go a bit further and you're going to have to access I-95 and the Turnpike and that's where we get into Bridgeview. So the kids from Central Parkway Lofts are in the Stewart District and they're already presented with that overcrowding. Bridgeview has been approved to basically one egress in and out, so anyone leaving there has to make a quick exit and a quick U-turn onto Indian, which also affects the traffic that goes into the hospital that's there. But again, because we look at these things in silos and these properties in silos, we don't look at them holistically, traffic, schools, et cetera which leads me to the Costco proposal because all of this manifests on Canner Highway ultimately at some point. And that is being presented to the LPA should there be quorum on projected to be April 29th. So even if you look at the 80% of the AMI for those properties that are coming up with Costco and you look at the traffic study for that and you look at the independent traffic study for the apartments that are there, there are two independent traffic studies. They do not cross and they do not get presented together. Yet there will be 7,000 cars for Costco and however many residents will be on that plot. So I'll close with this. There was an article in TC Palm that took a look at the Sportfish Marina Resort north of the Roosevelt Bridge. Board member Nicholas Schroth was quoted as saying that a commercial business shouldn't be responsible for the area's traffic troubles and parking at Harbridge is Harbridge's problem. These comments are beyond irresponsible and beyond the role of anyone making a decision on behalf of supposedly representing a community. And I'm not saying that it's, this board said this, I'm just pointing this out as a point because based on these comments and this attitude, which is pervasive amongst all of the independent boards, it's always somebody else's problem. Parking and traffic are not siloed issues. It's not one person's problem. It's not one company's problem. We all live in this backyard. The city staff, the development board, the redevelopment board, the LPA, the city commission and county commission need to start working more cohesively and collectively because it's your backyard too. Thank you. Okay, these are the only public comments I have on this subject. Did, do you want to say something? Yeah, the, 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 Tara McCarthy again, uh, and the staff may want to respond to some of the public comment, but frankly, I want to uh, applaud the adjoining owners. I've t I do a lot of this work, and a lot of times the adjoining owners, property owners will come up and it's fire and brimstone and it's not in my neighborhood. Their comments were timely and appropriate. Um, with respect to the PUD and the dangers in the future, an example I give is every year for the past 15 years, I've had a call from someone who says, 
I want to buy this golf course in this development and I want to turn it into residential units, what are my chances? And I say, if you wake up tomorrow and the sun is coming up in the west, you got a good chance, but otherwise you got zero chances. The PUD, the, the, the good news of the PUD is this is what we got to do. We can't do anything else. And in order to do anything else than is shown up here, we got to have another public hearing, notify everyone there, and coming back in front of these two boards. So the PUD is a guarantee that what you see is what you get. In terms of drainage, I'm not a drainage engineer, but I know, um, and, and the staff can address that uh, better than I, but I know that we've run into it in the county and in other jurisdictions that the standards in the past weren't what they are today. And the standards are more strict, and they'll get stricter in the future, of course. Uh, but we're going to have to pass some rather stringent tests with the city staff to get this project to move forward. And it better not all fall to the surrounding properties because our engineer did the surrounding property where that, that drainage pond, pond is located. So he's, uh, he's not going to want to have that happen. Uh, but I, I suspect the staff have some comments too. Staff, do you have any comments that you'd like to respond? Uh, yeah, it's Kev Freeman from uh, the Development Development, the Development Director. I just want to reassure the neighbors, uh, your comments obviously were received um, and understood. I want to reassure you that this plan is the plan that is going to be approved and attached to the planned unit development. That's a, that's a development agreement. So that means that whatever could be done in the R3 zoning, which could be buildings up to three stories, um, that's going to be taken away by this plan. So we're only allowing two-story buildings. Yes, the density is going to be increased, and that's part of the planned unit development agreement is it's, you know, a balance of what we get and what we, you know, we, sh we, you know, we share or whatever. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a vehicle, a planned unit development is a vehicle that really secures and lets the neighborhood know exactly what's going to go there. To change that, there would be th at least three more public hearings. You'd get full view of those. And I think, you know, I can't guarantee that it, something would change, but it would need to be through a public hearing process. Okay. Any other comment from you? Uh, regarding the stormwater, yes, we have much, much more stringent uh, stormwater uh, measures now. We've adopted different uh, rules and regulations in our code to um, look precisely at the issues that we were seeing in terms of outflow from projects. Um, and these will be very carefully considered during the um, final engineering drawings that have to be provided during the site plan. All right, if that is the end of the public comment, we will now open for board comment. Can we, I have a question. Um, the vegetation, why is there, ask, why are they asking for an exclusion from, for, regarding the height and everything regarding vegetation? Okay, so they're asking for a variance to the required buffer width. Mm -hmm. And typically that's 25 feet plus 10 feet for every extra story, in this case, 35 feet. And the code requires 25% of that to be landscaped, mm -hmm. typically with a wall or fence. And they're providing less than the 25%, which is 8.75. In this case, it's eight feet on the south border, and I think six and change on the west side. And so that's the variance that they're asking for. I thought there was also a variance on the height of some of the landscaping. I could have sworn that I read that it was only five feet instead of the required it's height. The, it's the width. It's the width. That, that's width, okay. Width, yeah. But in terms of the buffer, staff is recommending a, a six foot wall. That's correct. On okay. all boundaries. The six that, foot. That'll go across the right of way as well or the, that no. easement? No. No. On all boundaries except for the easement, for yeah. I have a few questions. Yes. Um, 
So in regards to the buffer, uh, so I know that we're just talking about, you know, really small differences in regards to what's allowed and what this project is proposing. And I was wondering if it would be possible to get denser planting where there is going to be landscaping. Yes. Yeah. We could include that as a condition for their development. I think, I think that would go a long way. Um, my other question is in regards to traffic. Um, I know that that Palm City Road is, is a hot mess and I'm just wondering, I know that, you know, these are basically what's there is what can be allowed, but can we not use this as an opportunity to like consider that hot right or, or, you know, do something about what is clearly, I understand that it's like Martin County residents that are causing the problem, not city of Stewart residents, but it is a problem for the people that live in this neighborhood and right. what can that, we do? It's a question. For, yeah. for the record, the uh, Palm City Road is actually a county road. The city has agreed to do maintenance on the road and provide the sidewalks and the speed bumps with Martin County as an attempt to regulate the traffic on it, but Martin County will not deed the road to the city of Stewart mm -hmm. because they know that we'd probably close the Palm City end of it. And so they won't do it. And it's it's a Martin County Road, not a right. Stewart Road. So we don't have the legal authority to make any changes to the traffic on it without uh -huh. Martin County approving them. So maybe the thing that we could do is all go to the county sure. commission meeting or contact our commissioner. commissioners about how yeah. we feel about that. Are we, are we allowed to make another comment? Just one on Palm City Road? I don't think so. Mr. Mortel, it, are they allowed? The board. I mean, okay, that's fine. Yeah. You can make... Oh, can you move the mic, the please? Microphone. Sorry. Terry Silcox, my only comment on the Palm City Road thing is the traffic is horrible on Palm City Road, as you all know. Um, but by changing the flow of it, you know that people will then turn in before they get to Palm City Road and instead come through our neighborhood. So they will all be feeding out through Hal Patioke Road if we do something extreme. Just, just please keep that in mind. We don't want the traffic in the neighborhood either. Um, okay, so yeah, I guess if there's nothing to be done. And then the, the only other thing, I, I could use a little bit more of an explanation too. I know that the, the difference between sort of, um, you know, R1 through three and PUD is a little fuzzy for me also. And, and I wanna just clarify to like assuage any fears. If, if you all could clarify for me that, you know, if this were to, you know, become rezoned and for whatever reason, you know, this guy leaves town and the project falls apart, Somebody couldn't swoop in and build a, you know, a 30 unit structure there. They would have to go through the same stringent process. Is that, that correct? Absolutely. Um, it would take the same process that you're seeing here today. Um, and I'm not sure they would be even be able to fit that amount of units on there. And, and the holding issue with every development is that how much parking can you get with that? So that's a constraint. Um, the PUD agreement that's formed, this development agreement with this site plan is, is very tight. Uh, and any changes to that um, substantially would always come to the local planning agency and the city commission. But what we're seeing here is a small, minor divest from the straight zoning. I mean, this board is used to seeing major divests when you zone, when you rezone from straight zoning to a PUD zoning. So, I mean, from, and in my perspective, I'm looking at this and we're talking about a unit and a half uh, that, that by right, they would have 11.61. We're asking for 13 and we're asking for a small buffer minor, but we're also getting six foot walls all the way around it. From my perspective, you know, this is a refreshing change of what we typically see. And that's 25 to 30 units per acre on, a, on PUDs. And so that's how I see this project, so. Yeah. I've got a couple comments. Um, <coughs> development condition number 12, and I, I, it sounds like that was a new condition regarding the two bike racks, EV parking space in the centralized mailbox. Um, that was not on the site plan, so I'm assuming yeah. that still needs to be worked out? No, no, we, we agree with that. We saw that prior to uh, just recently. Okay, we so it just that. needs to be annotated on the site yeah. plan? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, regarding the wall, so it sounds like uh, the applicant has agreed to the wall on the western side of the northern boundary, but has not yet agreed to the wall on the western side of the southern boundary or the southern portion of the property. Well, A, we just heard about it, so okay. I'm not certain which one they're asking for. We will certainly uh, take it into consideration and, and address it by the time we get to the I think what they're asking for is circum, a circumvention of the entire property boundary with the exception of cr the crossing the right of way and where it Correct. faces the right of way. Yep. So, we understand. It's just, and I think that's a reasonable request. I agree. <clears throat> I agree. Um, the other question I had was development condition number 21 w regarding condo conversion. It, it, I thought this was an apartment rental, and you're telling me it's not. It's townhome for sale. Did I read that wrong, staff? Correct. We're not. We're. we're uh, this is going to be a for sale product. Okay. And staff, you thought this was apartment rental. How does that change things? Uh, no, I'm just reading. I am reading where it did refer to rental, and and that that was a scrivener's or that was an oversight. That yeah. no. Okay. So that's. No. We'll. We'll. we'll scratch that and okay and from from our perspective we feel that the for sale is better for the neighborhood also. okay uh that's all i have okay any comment uh, my my only comment is that i went and looked at the property and i thought it was nicely fit for for the buildings but i would um and you have acknowledged the residents concern about runoff so you have acknowledge that so I would you know encourage you to do the best you can with the runoff but otherwise I think it's a beautiful property uh, just a couple of things one I apologize to the board I was late except for Larry I don't apologize to <laughs> but uh, a couple of quick things and uh, again staff I didn't didn't catch your original presentation but simply the 11 lots versus the PUD okay what is, what is the additional that is being given by the client versus if they just build on the 11 lots you understand what I'm saying okay so uh, I think you're saying what amenities are what it what is the applicant giving in, in trade for the variance request uh, basically you know if we give them two additional <coughs> units right okay I think they're given right away. Am I correct? They're actually um, going to use part of the right away, um, I believe. If you can see what here, like. they got they have a drive aisle through there. Yeah. Well, we're, we're donating right away to the to the county. It's county road, so we got to donate to the okay. county. So I'm saying you're going to donate yeah. right away, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, in a, as far as the drainage, uh, yeah, these small sites, they're always tough. Uh, what most of you don't see is the engineers use what they call um, under drains, okay? Uh, there are basically drain fields underneath the parking lot in addition to the retention area in the rear. And uh, if there becomes an issue, the engineer can always consider the pervious concrete as a, uh, a you know, addition to that does reduce your drainage outfall. Um, so I guess that'd be the only thing is let them look at the drainage, uh, just add some previous concrete in the critical areas, and uh, that certainly will reduce some of the uh, offsite potential from leaving. Uh, outside that, I really don't have any questions. Do we, all right, you may make another public, public comment at State your name, please. Uh, Peter Silcox. I just wanted to mention that that water retention area is not uh, not a part of the area being developed. It's for the it's owned by the homeowners associations from the seven houses on the other side. And sorry, oh, you have one also. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's oh, there's a retention there's area there on their property. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. And I also, I agree with the increased vegetation, or denser vegetation, I should say, and then the requirement of the wall, the other wall be added. 
Um, does anybody have any other comments we'd like to make? Would anybody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve with the conditions that uh, denser vegetation is added, that the applicant uh, provides the, the location for the two bike racks, EV parking space, centralized mailbox, six foot wall is added along the western and southernmost portion. And is that it? What's that? I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Would anybody like to second? I'll second it. All in favor? No, I need a vote. I'll take a vote. Board member Bromfield? Yes. Board member Strom? Yes. Board member Massing? Yes. Board member Mathers? Yes. Board member Vitali? Yes. Chair Lorreen? Yes. One, just one follow up, sorry. Also to scratch condition 21, oh, the yeah. condo conversion. <coughs> Thank you very much. All right, that ends this that portion of this evening's items. Next, we will move to the rezoning of Flamingo Avenue. Thank you. I would also, I would like to ask, excuse me, while we are waiting, if people will please, if you have public comment that you want to make, please pass them forward so that we can collect them. Okay. Can everyone please lower your voices, sit down and pass public comment so we can continue on with the meeting? Thank you. Staff, are you ready to make the presentation? Ready? Yes. Okay, great. Good afternoon, board. Tom Reese again, uh, senior planner. The item uh, before you today is uh, Flamingo, called Flamingo Avenue Properties Rezoning from R1 to R2. The applicant is the city of Stewart. Flamingo Avenue, south of Ocean Boulevard and north of 8th Street. It's for 15 properties uh, rezoning from R1 to R2. This is basically a housekeeping um, uh, project that uh, was, was initiated by uh, illegal duplexes that exist on four of the site, uh, four of the parcels. So the um, future land use of uh, low density residentials will remain the same. We're not changing that. And you can see that there is an existing R an R2 block in between the properties to the north of, of 6th Street and then properties to the south of 7th Street. So what this exercise and housekeeping project will do is it will create a contiguous block of R2 zoning uh, represented by the orange, as well as legalize the existing four uh, two family units um, that are currently in the R1 zoning. So I mentioned the four units that are currently illegal and non conforming. There are two units to the north, north of 6th Street, and then the two units just south of 7th Street. Uh, as represented by the letter B, there's one family units that are currently legal and conforming. There's currently one, two, three, and four existing one family units that are non-conforming that will 
be brought into uh, conforming status once the rezoning happens. There's existing two family, mostly in the existing R2 uh, zoning that are legal and conforming. And then finally, there's one single family that exists in the R2 fam uh, zoning that is also legal and conforming. So this is our zone, this is our uh, setback and pervious impervious and lot size uh, chart that we use every day in uh, the planning department. And you can see that the R1 zoning requires 7,500 square feet minimum in size and a 75 foot frontage. So when we rezone to R2, that will re be reduced to 5,000 square feet and 50 foot minimum for the width or frontage. And then of course the R2, which requires the bigger lots, are going to remain at 7,500 and 75 feet in width. So as a condition uh, for this rezoning, staff had to uh, come up with some language that um, allowed for two-family unit setbacks caused by the rezoning that are legal, they will become legalized. However, any proposed structural additions to those two-family units shall adhere to the R2 zoning district. So, in, so any of those units that uh, are now in R2 would have to hold to those um, um, setback requirements. Here you can see an idea of what some of those setbacks are. For instance, in the R1, I mentioned that there's a 75 foot minimum width and a 7,500 square feet in area um, requirement. Then when we get to the R2, one family that drops to 5,000 square feet, um, which by the way, will legalize four of the, of the existing single family homes uh, that are currently non-conforming. And then finally, the larger R2, two-family lots, or the, the, the larger 75-foot, 30-foot front setback, um, 10 on the sides and 20 in the rear. Why are the single families not conforming exactly? There's, there's four single families uh, units that are uh, their minimum, they don't meet the minimum lot width the lot size. and lot area. And they were just built and, day, and they were, yeah, it's, it's hard to say when it happened. Some of the houses were built prior to 1990 when Dwani came in and we uh, came up with these overlays and, and zoning requirements. And, and um, so as far as the timing, yes, one happened probably shortly before the overlay and, and, and thus they're nonconforming for many years. So this is a chance to clean it up not only for the uh, illegal two-family units, but also for some of the single-family units that are non-conforming. And with that, staff recommends approval of this ordinance with the attached exhibits. And that concludes my presentation and open, open for questions. Okay, and so, and you're the only part of the presentation for that since it's the city making the recommendation? The city is making the okay. recommendation. Fantastic. All right, we will start with public comment. I will say that at the beginning of this, we approved that public comment would be on the agenda items at hand. So I would ask that everyone, if you have a comment, it needs to be about the specific agenda item, please. How long do we have to speak? Three minutes. You have three minutes to speak. Okay, first up is Helen McBride. Helen McBride, I'm from Flamingo Avenue. I've been, I feel like a teacher every time I get up here. I've lived down that street for 48 years. Now, unfortunately, the planning department has no history of our area. Uh, back well, when I built it, we, Bob and I built the house, half of the street was in the county and half was in the city of Stewart. Uh, in the 80s, the city, when they could annex, 
decided they were going to annex, like the street, my backyard was the county line. They were going to annex right up to Monterey Road. And uh, they had the meeting at J.D. Parker Cafeteria. And our concern, the residents of the city and the residents of the county, ours was we, the duplexes were there when I moved in. And I moved in in 1972. Um, and with the whole history of that street. Uh, and we were concerned. And the city of Stewart back then, of course, unfortunately, you know, that was back then. We were concerned about the duplexes. They were, you no, know, we were R1 housing. They were R2. The city said, no, this is an R1. When the city annexes it into the city, it'll be an R1 area. And, but the duplexes can stay, and if, if anything happens, they can not rebuild, but, uh, you know, make sure, like, the four, three walls and that. Uh, the houses, the reason of the... Again, the houses he's talking about were in the county, and we annexed them into the city. Back then, I know there's one house on the corner there that he was supposed to be for him and his mother, and they let him put two houses with very small, you know, footage around. Now you're, the planning department or the city of Stewart, whomever, want to penalize all of us. There's nothing wrong with keeping it R1. There's no land there to be built on. And I don't know, we've lived, this was in the 80s. I can remember that meeting and the comments and uh, what happened then. We've, it's a beautiful neighborhood. Everyone takes care of their property. Why, just because they're bookkeeping or they can't read, but maybe if, I'll be happy to come up and tell them the history of that area. And there's another woman sitting, I know in the audience, her mother has a house for years and she's living there now. We know the history of our street, but now you want to, the city wants to penalize us for something they did, and we had no, you know, they, they didn't listen to us, and they, they annexed that all into us. So I, I can't see, you know, I, I'm, like that young lady that got before me, all of a sudden our planning department is going way out in left field, what they want to do to this little city that's only 6.8 miles. And uh, I want to thank you for the uh, green on that other project. I'm all for more green. Uh, but please, we, there's nothing wrong with our neighborhood as an R1. That's what we were promised back in the 80s by the city. And uh, the county didn't want to lose it, but they, you know, it beca all became city property. And we cannot be penalized, I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Frank McChrystal, I, wait, excuse me, we had stated in the beginning of the meeting that we're not going to do clapping and cheering, we're just going to make our comments and move on. Okay, Mr. Oh. Frank McChrystal. When does my time start? No. My, uh, my description of what's going on will be a lot more layman's terms and probably make more sense to everybody than Mr. Reese's. It's from driving around and looking, okay? There are nine legally zoned duplex lots at the north end of Flamingo and Ocean. There are three non-compliant duplexes built on single-family lots on Flamingo Avenue. The city of Stewart, in order to legalize existing two-family units, there are three, and provide uniform zoning, is requesting to rezone 15 current single-family home lots into duplex lots, turning an entire three-block area bordered by Flamingo, Ocean, 8th, and 5th into duplex zoning. The nine existing legal duplex lots will expand in number to 24. The existing nine du duplexes stand out. Evidence of investors and rentals make this section of the Broadway section of St. Lucie Estates look way different from the majority of the single family homes. Take 7th Street as far east as you can, please, and take a good look at the stark, dismal difference. Welcome to 2021. After receiving my notice of proposed rezoning from the city, I Google searched the effect of duplex zoning in existing single family home neighborhoods. I was expecting affirmation of my basic premise of more duplexes equals more investors and more rentals, which equals less single family homeowners with a vested interest in home values. Instead, I found article after article describing the single family lot zoning as the main source of all of our environmental and social problems. The overall premise in 2021 on the internet is that single family zoning has to go. Of course, the race card was played. Single family zoning excludes lower income minorities and could never afford a single family home. Nope, not in my neighborhood where people of all color live. 
okay? And then there's the environmental card they played. The zoning of large pieces of land to single family homes leads to sprawl with everyone having to drive everywhere, okay? Not my neighborhood. I can walk wherever I need to go and when Uncle Joe pushes gas up to seven bucks, I will survive. So why does the city of Stewart want to rezone three city blocks to duplex zoning in an existing thriving single family home neighborhood? We need more affordable housing will be the cry, but it's deeper than that. There are city leaders who view anything traditional as Neanderthal, and we Neanderthals need to be re-educated. Minneapolis 2040 plan, which passed in 2019, allows duplexes and triplexes on all single family homes. The whole state of Oregon, House Bill 2001 passed in 2019, legalizes duplexes on all single family land with population, with city's population greater than 10,000. <sighs> In my early canvassing, about 17 neighbors so far, after the initial look of disbelief and disappointment, the resounding unanimous reaction has been, oh, hell no, okay? And I'll finish with one question. Where do slumlord investors and rentals fit into your long-term sustainability program with the goal of becoming the greenest city in America? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jim Rollins, please. Good evening. Um, let me get in order here. Uh, my name's Jim Rollins, and my wife and I, Mary, live at 1645 Southeast A Street. We're the, uh, at the bottom of the map right there, one of the seats. We're a subdivided lot. Um, and we are zoned R1, residential. Uh, we purchased our house over 18 years ago. And one of the factors of buying our house is we wanted to live in a residential area. And knowing that, when we purchased our house, we knew some of the surrounding zonings, which were R2. So that was a major influence for us to purchase our house. Now it's coming about that I mean, I really don't understand the housekeeping end of it, but it's gonna affect the value of my property. And it's gonna affect the people across the street from me, south of me. It's gonna affect the people west of me. And then I'm gonna be affected by what my neighbors can do, as all know, that an R2 zoning has minimal restrictions, okay? less restrictions in height if you've got the setbacks there's a number of things you can do and i didn't buy my house in in letting my neighbor determine my value of my property okay so this is what's going to affect me it's all about the value of my property and keeping our neighborhood the way it is um, I mean, I could stand up here and give you another bunch of reasons for that. Uh, but right now, housekeeping is not an issue. How that map looks, I don't really care. I invite each and every one of you to come through our neighborhood. And we've managed with this mixed. So I have a letter, and you're all welcome to a copy of it, that we referenced, and it was with our uh, paperwork when we bought our house that 1994, when this section was annexed to the city, the city looked out at the best interest of the homeowner and the resident, okay? Like I say, we have a lot of landlords, people that are not residents of the city of Stewart that make a lot of money off of our neighborhood, and that's not a problem as long as they keep it up. But I just really believe that there's more to this zoning change than is, uh, is out on the table. I've heard rumor of that there is a, a permit issue. Well, we have a process. We have a process which we call variances. And uh, I'm well aware of it because I wanted to put a little shed on my property and I'm, I'm on a split lot so I don't have a lot of room on my side setbacks. It's gonna cost me $810 just to even submit a permit. So if there's issues with permitting and people buying uh, homes in there with classification differences, then we need to table it 
in the process that we have. And again, I'd like to invite any of you through our neighborhood and, uh, and see how this is gonna affect our home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Eric Winstrom. Hello, my name's Eric Wickstrom. I live at 614 Southeast Flamingo. It's a house with a big pink chimney. I'm sure if you drive by, you've seen it. Um, I moved there 18 months ago, paid $400,000, and really was looking forward to a nice, great neighborhood. Um, and then I hear about this thing, and all I could ask myself is why? I mean, why is this going on? And then I hear it's only for a housekeeping measure. That to me is ridiculous. Second of all, um, it says right here, rezoning to be consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. What is that comprehensive plan? Where is that? Is that is a comprehensive plan to get more duplexes in, to increase the tax rolls, to get affordable housing? I just don't really understand it. Um, and you know, to me, I've never heard of something where you have three non-conformings, and instead of fixing it, you're gonna make everything else non-conforming or change it to conforming. That's backwards, all I've got to say. Thank you, sir. Tamara Lucy. Hi, my name's Tamara Lucy. I live at Flamingo and Ape. I live right in front of Mary and Jimmy. We live in our neighborhood because it is a single family. And the more we're learning about the R2 rezoning, it sounds like there's more that can be done than just adding duplexes. It sounds more like you can put in maybe some commercial or other things that we're not aware of. So what is the agenda for the area? That's the question here. What are your future plans? It's not about affordable housing. You're trying to get rid of the affordable housing. And the gentleman that just spoke, what he paid for his house compared to what I paid for my house three years ago is twice the value. You're taking away the affordable housing. This isn't gonna help. It's just gonna skyrocket our property taxes. Who's gonna be able to afford there? I was lucky enough to be able to afford a house on a single income when I did buy. I couldn't afford a $400,000 home. So I appreciate your time and I hope you consider that this neighborhood is a single family neighborhood and we bought there for that reason. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Christopher Collins. Hi, how you guys doing? So I live right across the street from those uh, lower two A's over there. I know Kurt, he's right across the street. Um, those two units are single family units. It's just splitting a duplex in half. So all I can see that the real issue is is those two A's up on the top. So beyond conforming and paperwork, and I'm sure you love to look at that map and it'd be beautiful and orange all the way on that block. I hope that there's some level of appreciation from human, not just paper, the 30 plus people who are sitting here in this room telling you, please don't mess with our area. You guys are the gods of local planning. You have power to do whatever you want. But I hope you realize you represent the people in this town. And these are the people that live on Flamingo, that live on this street. And I moved there knowing all that those duplexes were there and that's okay. I live right across the street from those duplexes. And I, I, cool. But I don't want any more duplexes there, man. I really don't. I want to have more single family homes. I have two little two and three year old girls. I'm married, I own my home, and I invest in my home. I plant a ton of banana trees. You would love me, Jackie. I've got Barbados cherries, I've got mangoes galore. I put a lot of energy and money into my lot because it's important to me and my family for the future. When I look at those duplexes, it's not the same thing. It's a commodity. People are living there, they're using that facility. They're not investing in it the same. When the cops come, they come to that little horseshoe. When people are screaming and cursing at each other outside, 
It's on that horseshoe. And I'm all for people being able to afford where they live, but the reality is, is I want people invested in my street. I want people that want to live there long term, that want to make their houses nice, and that's not necessarily the case. Everybody's honest with R2. So I really hope that you guys will listen to the people that are in this room and not just go with the bureaucratic paperwork, you know, pushing papers and passing stuff. I appreciate you guys doing this and representing us. So thank you. Thank cool. you. Jennifer Kadar. Hello, my name is Jennifer Kadir. I'm um, a resident of Flamingo, 612 Flamingo Ave, directly across from the R2 that is already zoned. And since that zoning happened, we have drug dens now in our neighborhood. We have cops and ODs there every day. I've been personally asked for a sting operation out of my house. I do not think that this is okay. I have a little baby. Um, the people that live on the corner, there's DCF there all the time because no one watches their children. People get drunk, there's fights. The kids are going up and down the street torturing cats. Like, it's not okay. And so what we've seen from the ones that you've already zoned as R2, those people don't keep up their houses. Their yards are a mess with just litter and trash. The little children, when elderly men walk by, say that they want to beat them up. It's not okay for what's already happened. Clearly the people that are owning these duplexes don't vet their renters and they don't even legally have duplexes. I don't know how it is. The people that live across the street from me, they put a wall in, but they haven't subdivided the um, utilities. So the person that lives in the studio on one side still has to pay half for the people that are on the other side because there's not two meters. So they're not even to me, following the rules in general. So why are we rewarding these people that illegally subdivided their house by rezoning everything instead of leaving it single family? Um, you said you want to clean up. I'm hoping you meant the neighborhood and not just a map because this is our neighborhood. We're not going to be able to afford anything else in moving forward with the way prices are skyrocketing. Housing, there is a housing shortage and I totally understand that. but. The solution is not to have people rent duplexes. It's to empower people to become single family homeowners. And that is what we want our neighborhood to be. And so I would really hope that you would take a look at our neighborhood and not a map and help us clean up our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Doug Fitzwater. Hello, Doug Pittswater with Lucido and Associates. Unfortunately, Michael K. Tree could not be here tonight, but I'm, I was asked to represent him. He owns a duplex at 505 Flamingo. And um, he actually does have a building permit in and pending with the building department to make substantial improvements to his pr property. But when he was going through the process, the city of Stewart recognized that it's an R1 zoning, it's an existing duplex, and it's non-conforming. So he wasn't able to pull the building permit to make the improvements to the property, which, which it does need. So, um, so I, we're just looking for some sort of resolution to this issue, if you could work with us and come up with a solution to, uh, to allow him to make the improvements to his property. Okay, it was that the end of your comment? That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Albert Brew here. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Bueller. I live at the corner of uh, Ninth Street and Flamingo. And to be perfectly frank with you, we moved there for the neighborhood. We took an existing home that was ready to be knocked down, gutted it, and completely redid it. We put a lot of money into it. Less than five years ago, I was in front of this chamber with Mr. Reitz. We applied for a variance, which because of our neighbors, and I have no qualms about saying this, were against it. So instead of fighting it, we acquiesced to their wishes and abandoned the variance. So now we've been here for five years, still love the neighborhood. 
these neighbors are great people. And frankly, instead of trying to rezone these pieces, why don't you have the compliance board or however this is handled take care of the, the R2 zoning? If, if they want to put a, a duplex up there, why not a single family home if you want the investment? And make that a priority for the other non-conforming wishes. Please, no more, no, no duplexes in our neighborhood. We don't want them. It's obvious to me and everyone here that it's not going to work out. And that's about all I got to say. I didn't invest in this neighborhood to have duplexes. That's all there is. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Are there any other public comment before we move? Yes. Helen McBride from Flamingo. I'm willing to sign anything, legal document, to say the duplex that and he paid with it, the, the he just they just bought is grandfathered in, and there's no reason why he can't pull any permit. And I, I was there at that meeting, and Judy Ripper, and uh, the, 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 a lot of them are gone now. But I'll be happy to sign any legal document saying these duplexes were grandfathered in. And one another thing I've noticed that at the, where the duplexes are, a lot of young couples are buying them. And like I say, my sister and I, like the gentleman said, across the street, they're, the families are one on one side and the mother on the other side. But I am willing to sign any legal document saying they can pull a permit on any duplex on Flamingo, on a 7th Street, in Ocean, because I was there. And Terry O'Neill was the planning director at the time. Thank you. Thank you. May I start? Uh, yes, we can now move to board comment. So um, one of the advantages of being a long-term bureaucrat um, with the city of Stewart is I recall exactly what Helen is describing. Assurances were made to this neighborhood when they annexed this, and I can only imagine uh, there should be a record of that from the annexation of the Kruger property. That was right where the packing house, as I recall, uh, and the surrounding duplexes. They were annexed in at, they were duplexes already, and they matched the city's zoning. Uh, I personally can't imagine turning an entire neighborhood upside down to does rezone an entire neighborhood from R1 to R2. Um, I believe there's probably a record uh, of the commission action when all this was annexed, and those zonings were, were annexed in with the city's zoning at the time. I don't, Duwani had absolutely nothing to do with this. Uh, this was annexed property, and those, zone, those were the zonings at the time because they were duplexes when they were, zone, when they were when they were annexed into the city. So, and there was a crowd at the time when, when, when it was annexed. So I, I would recommend that you reach way back into the city's records, and I think you'll find exactly that's what happened. So I am a proponent of leaving this neighborhood alone. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, and before you make your comment, I would also like to ask, you know, based on some of the things I'm hearing. Um, if you look at this and where the R1 is, it's really a very small portion that is the R2. Why are you trying to designate it all as R2 if the majority of the neighborhood is R1? I'd like to know the reasoning there okay. you were going the, with. The law prohibits spot zoning. Yeah. So you can't just give a single or two people special zoning that's different than their adjacent neighbors. So the development department must make it a continuous or a neighborhood type zoning to conform so, it. So you're referring to where there were the existing duplexes that, as we said, were kind of grandfathered in back in the day and have been there for many years. So the whole reason you're trying to change the zoning, I just want to make sure that I understand, mm -hmm. is based on just a cleaning up housekeeping issue and the fact that you have duplexes, which automatically is a default, if I understand what you're saying, that you then have to default to trying as a housekeeping issue to change them all to R2. Am I correct in that? So when we um, did the analysis on the, the whole block that you see, so uh, everything that's highlighted with a letter uh, up north and south of the um, existing R2, 
we found that eight of the 15 um, lots did not conform to the R1 use. So that was, so it's more than 50% of those who did not conform. I must admit, I wasn't privileged to the history that this neighborhood has. Um, you know, I'm minded to say, let's not go any further with this until we figure out better where we go. I think it's this, you know, we've got a very strong neighborhood opinion here. It's not the role of the development department to, you know, strike out at the neighborhood and force on them what they don't want. I don't think that's correct. Um, but we do have issues in this uh, neighborhood and we do need to figure out how to resolve those. Okay. Um, the intent of this was entirely just to, from a, a legal perspective, is to consolidate the zoning in that area as we have to do under law. We can't, as, Mark, uh, as the city attorney said, it's very difficult to go in and spot zone, do different colors all over the place is the easiest way to explain it. Um, but we do have to resolve some of the activities in that neighborhood um, in that they're non-conforming. And we want to help. The reason why we, we move this you know, primarily is to help the people who are in the league in the non-conforming so lots. That's the re real to reason. To be candid about it, there's yeah. an enormous amount yeah. of activity yeah. where people do changes to property without permits. Mm -hmm. And the only people being punished currently are the ones that are trying to follow the law and coming into the city for a permit. The, the, our code in paragraph, or, chapter 8.03.00 has a very descriptive discussion about existing non-conforming development in lots. And these qualify as that, but as a result under paragraph four, the lawful use of the land existing on July 23rd, 1990, although such use does not conform to the provisions of this chapter, may be continued. However, no such non-conforming use shall be enlarged or increased, nor shall any non-conforming use be extended to occupy a greater area of land. People have turned out in the last 20, 25 years to want porches, but you can't do it. So we could go in and code enforce everybody in the R1s and everybody in the R2s in that neighborhood, which would be about 15 of these houses for adding porches, for adding back patios, for, for, being, for adding, converting garages, expanding the space in their duplexes, adding enclosing porches, expanding the duplexes. We didn't want to do that either because basically we, our position on it was nothing's changing in this neighborhood. There's not a single vacant lot over there. All the duplexes that are going to be duplexes are duplexes. They're already there. In order to build another duplex in that neighborhood right now, you'd have to tear down a single family home. The $400,000 home Eric was talking about, if you bought it and tore it down, you wouldn't make money on a duplex. So there is no development opportunity. It was literally to conform the neighborhood. And like Kevin said, it doesn't matter if you vote no, that's fine. We just had a duty to bring it forward to you because we have two different people coming in with applications and caused us to notice the neighborhood. And we noticed, as he mentioned, eight R1s that are non-conforming and four of the duplexes that have made expansions and done things illegally or without permits. And as a result, we can always go back and you know address it one by one and code enforce it or whatever. We just, what we wanted to do is just leave everybody the way they were. And, and I, I get it, if, they, if you don't wanna make the change, don't. I, it's, it, it, the neighborhood doesn't want it, I totally understand. So I, I do ask, because when you keep referring to the neighborhood, so you're not including those to the left that are not in the red marking? So you're not saying the neighborhood. No, is those are already. Those are already zoned. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying right. like that's part of the larger neighborhood. But, so and those are R2. Half of then. But those are that zoning. Okay. Those the well, ones. Wait, no, to the sorry, left. There, there are the yellow is R1. The okay, red is. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah. Okay. But they're not. That's not changing. Okay. Uh, Fifteen. Lines. Fifteen. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You may. You, Again, if you can come uh, yeah, to the mic yeah, and just ask your question with your name, please. Uh, my name is Jennifer Kadir. I live on Flamingo. If spot zoning was illegal, why did you spot zone that one area? Again, I'm not fully they, conversant the, with the history. The, the city didn't. Yeah. As, as Mr. Massing mentioned, 
they were annexed in, and when the annexation take, took place, the, the, the duplexes were already built. So the city said those duplexes can stay, and we're not going to touch them because they were there before they became part of the city. The difference is they're not allowed to add a driveway. They're not allowed to add a porch. They're not allowed to add a front eave. They're not allowed to add any addition room to their house because they can't change exactly how they were when they were annexed in under the code. The house across the street from me, I'm pretty sure, was converted to a duplex afterwards. And, and that's part of the problem. Well, that's a zoned one that's already R2. Okay, so it would be it would be entitled to the ones that are already R2. Then why won't they give them utilities to have both sides split their utilities? I don't have any idea what because they Maybe probably didn't get a permit. Not, that, this is what we're talking about. There's people there. There's property owners there that don't pull permits, and and you know, and the people that do pull permits get held because we can't help them. So let me ask a question yeah. from a legal perspective: for the existing R2s or the ones that are running into this problem that were grandfathered in, is there any mechanism to allow them to make changes besides rezoning all of them? They could come before the Board of Adjustment, but the actual use of the property, because it's R1, does not allow duplex, so they would not. Even though they were grandfathered they, in. They, they, they can put yeah. a new roof on, they yeah. can paint the walls, yeah. Yeah. they can put tile in, they can do that, they just can't expand their house in, in any way. They can't make it, they can't add a porch, yeah. they can't add a room. Even if they went before the Board of Adjustment, could they? I don't know. I think what we're talking to, what we're talking to here is there's, there's, two, okay. there's two issues. One, the existing properties in the R1 that are single family could go to the Board of Adjustment and find, you know, variances for setbacks or, or whatever. The existing properties that are held as duplexes in the R1 are more problematical in that the, um, the use is not allowed in that zoning district. So the use of a duplex is not allowed in the R1 zoning district. But they built the duplex illegally correct. on an R1 property, correct? Again, I don't know where. Because you didn't annex in R1, you annexed in duplexes. So my question no, it is, was, it, uh, did, it, did they build a duplex? There, there was some R1s annexed in too. Okay, but were they single family or were they duplexes at the time? You remember it better than I do, Larry. <laughs> the one across the street from me was a single family and they... How long ago? Um, 1998, I think she said that they put the wall in. So they illegally converted it to right. a duplex. And it was reported to well, that's if we okay we have three people with with hands up uh, we will allow those comments but if anybody else wants to make a comment I really need you to formally write it down okay you sir as I, as I went around talking to people and tell them what was going on I was hoping I was thinking that the, the majority of people would agree with me hey why are we going to turn three city blocks into duplex zone for the sake of three non-conforming duplexes on Flamingo? And, and my gut was that everyone would agree, you know what, let, take care of those people. You need, don't need to, you know, let them grant whatever's grandfathered in, go ahead, let it happen, whatever you got to do, okay? But what was interesting is the people that lived across the street from these three illegal uh, duplexes that found out they were illegal, they were like, oh, heck no, this use this as a chance to get rid of them. So I'm saying, okay, well, that'd be a good place to start the negotiations from. But I don't think the majority of the neighborhood, and I'm not saying I got a lot of time, but I will make sure. What you're looking at right there is just a little piece of our great neighborhood. It goes Dolphin, Madison, East Parkway. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, if, if this gets pushed forward, I'm just going to make it my personal uh, deal to make sure everyone shows up for the next one, not just the people that got their notices within 300 feet. And again, I think the majority of the people would say, look, take care of those three however you have to, and please leave us alone. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, who's already spoken once, and then we'll take uh, the gentleman over in the back. 
approach and give you all a copy of this. I'm good. I thought I recognized you. Thank How you. are you? <laughs> Thank you. So this sheet that I handed out to you is what was in our buyer's package in 2003, okay? But I just want to make, I'm, we're one of the victims, okay? I just want to make something kind of clear to everybody. Right here is where I'm, I'm on a divided lot. I'm right here. If you rezoned those three lots as R2, the Bravo lot right here, he has less requirements. I do too, as long as I stay within the requirements to R2, meaning I can have multiple families. Uh, it would be tough for me because of my setbacks on the sides of my house. But Bravo could build a three-story multi-family unit there. I didn't buy that for that. I didn't buy, and I don't think the neighbors, I got several neighbors that live across the street, directly across the street, they didn't buy in for that. I got neighbors, Tammy is on the opposite side of me, and neighbors on Flamingo right here that don't want that. And I think that goes throughout the neighborhood when you go to reclassify an R1 to an R2, that you have less restrictions. And that's the point I want to make. I mean, we have work in Stewart to clean up all of our neighborhoods, okay? But we're not going to get, I'm, I don't think I need to go to a financial expense because I need a color code on that map. It's 2021. We can do a lot of things with maps in seconds. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Kevin Logue. And this will be our final comment for the evening. Well, I can't believe that I played taxpayers' money and you got the lamest map up there as possible. I mean, there's surveyors here that are my neighbors. This is pathetic. I really can't believe it. You can't even read that. Okay, I live at 815 Dolphin Drive. Been there for 25 years. Ray Elliott's here, he, you know, has all the properties around here. He's uh, been here forever, most of his life. He rents out houses in our neighborhood and all around that area. When I first came in, the house next to me, it was trashed. This neighborhood has gone, everybody here, right here, right here has increased the value of the property. And I love Ray to death and the renters, don't take care of properties. He has a house next door that the renters just left. He came in there, he's fixing it up, okay? We're fighting not only stupid duplexes, we're fighting that people wanna buy our neighborhood and rent out the houses. A guy, um, Hill, on the corner of, uh, where he is? He just built the house. It was a foreclosure, fixed it totally up, and then you can rent it out for 200, two, I don't know, $2,000 a month. We don't want that. We want a nice neighborhood that we bought our property for, R1 all the way. So the duplexes that you're looking at are just like trash. You bull down those downs and you re, Rezone them for R1. That's all there is to it. Okay? There's duplexes on the other side near Kruger Creek. Okay? And then if you go on the other side of East Ocean, there's a duplexes over there. They're all nice. People are fixing them up. This trash crap, just tore it down. It's not going to, they can't fix anything. It's wood frame houses. Let's make it nice. We're not paying our tax dollars for you to come in and tell us that you need affordable houses. You can't even have a parking garage downtown. We have to fight traffic. I got to ask a lady to move so I can park here to make to the meeting. It's getting really pathetic. And this is the fourth time 
that I've been to these meetings for zoning. Don't change the zoning. We don't want zero lot lines, you know? So let's please stop. Let's think about this. Like the man says, it's a 2021. You can't produce a map so people can read. It's absolutely pathetic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the rest of the board, do we have other comment? Sure. I agree with Larry. I don't think we need to mess with the zoning right now. I think there's a potential solution for some of these non-conforming uses outside of this, uh, whether it's grandfathering or board of adjustment or commission. Um, I appreciate the non-conforming uses that want to fix up and upkeep. There should be a way for them to be able to do that without a rezoning. Yeah. I would agree. Any other comment? Yeah, I agree that it's, it, we should try and find a way to allow people to improve some of these properties since I don't think bulldozing them down is going to be possible. We want to make sure that there's a legal way for them to approve it, but it doesn't seem like this is the one that folks love. I, I agree, too. It shouldn't, the, the duplexes should be allowed to do the upkeep that they need, but not because it's a beautiful neighborhood. I walk through there all the time, and the homes are very nicely kept. I agree. Uh, Larry, I got a question for you. Sure. Under the existing building codes, the codes allow you to uh, repair, just not expand on existing buildings. Well, the, what they're describing is something to do with the zoning. The building code will allow you to, if you do it per code, you can do just about anything. What they're describing is, is that the zoning provisions right. preclude uh, expansion and things like that. Right, but so, the code itself. The city code regarding non-conforming use, because any other, like R1 can expand in an R1 as long as they don't violate the setback. Correct. The non-conforming use can't expand. Right, and I, I know we've had that in the past where incidents like this popped up. Uh, I think probably, Mr. Mortel, maybe you remember, uh, we had some gas stations, non-conforming uses, and almost, uh, I don't know if it was conditional use uh, or it was through the Board of Adjustment, but when they were really trying to improve neighborhoods and the owners wanted to do it, uh, we had some process. I think it yeah, was- Yeah, it's a Board of Adjustment. Base, it, right? the, the reality is if, if the, I, I'm not a betting man, but I doubt that this neighborhood would be real excited if one of these duplexes came in to expand their footprint. I think the Board of Adjustment would probably be just as resistant, but for what it's worth, I agree that you could go through a Board of Adjustment. On a single process, it's a lot of houses. We actually thought, in light of the fact that there were no vacant lots, that the change wasn't actually going to change the neighborhood. It was just going to vest it the way it already is and we didn't want to do a spot zoning, so we had to draw the map to include all the duplexes that we saw were there, and that was the only reason for it. I, it doesn't sound like the board's going to have a motion or a second, so it doesn't matter, but that was the motivation wasn't for any nefarious effect or for any new development. Sure. It was just to really capture what's there. But the, the existing duplex owners, they do have a process to get to the city, individual lots, uh, whatever it is, if they're really going to improve the building, okay? There's two processes. There's the one where you can go to Board of Adjustment, and then there's the weekend warrior right. <laughs> that just does it on the weekend. Oh, but well. that's a Those code enforcement. Right, that happens all the time. That's right. a code enforcement. Right. I mean, that's why you have code enforcement. Is and, right. and it sounds like this is a pretty active neighborhood who probably makes phone calls. So it's... Okay. Plus, Sorry. we're just advisory, so our conditions and what you have presented tonight uh, typically will follow up to the commission and stuff. So, uh, again, our votes are advisory, uh, and uh, but the commission listens to the records and stuff to see what the community is saying. So, everything you probably said tonight and your I, opinions I, I, are going to be. I, I think I heard Kevin say he's not going to move it forward. So, absent a direction from this board to move it forward, the, the development department is just going to withdraw it. It's going to go away. Yeah. yeah, but this board can make that decision alone. Always, if we don't take it up because it's a land use change, it stops here, then, right? Oh, okay. I was mistaken. 
Okay, would somebody like to make a motion or a non-motion? Can I make a motion to withdraw the well, agenda? You could make a motion recommending staff don't move any further forward with this. I think that would advise that. Yep. Second. I second that. <laughs> Jordan, would you like to do the roll call? Yeah. Board member Bromfield? Yes. Board member Strom? Yes. Board member Massing? Yes. Board member Vitali? Yes. Board member Mathers? Yes. Chair Lorene? Yes. There you go. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any other staff updates this evening? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute.